the Pinebook Pro. It's a $200 ARM-based Linux laptop made by Pine64. And Pine64 is a community-based, open-source hardware vendor that makes single board computers, kind of like the Raspberry Pi, and devices like this based on that. Earlier, they had a Pinebook computer that they made, which is the predecessor to this Pinebook Pro. And the Pinebook was kind of like a toy that they made for their users to just try out and see if they could have a, a reasonable machine that maybe they could install some software on and mess around with. But with the Pinebook Pro, they're trying to make a daily driver type laptop. And I think with the power that they've packed into this thing, they've come very close, if not succeeded with this thing. And this thing has six cores in it. It has the ARM big dot little architecture, which means that it has four cores dedicated to sort of low performance computing tasks and two really big cores that are dedicated to high performance tasks. So already you've got more cores in this thing than the new Raspberry Pi. This thing has four gigs of RAM, which is very impressive for a device like this for only $200 a 1080p screen, a really nice keyboard, a trackpad, and some magnesium housing here, which makes the whole thing feel very pro. We're gonna take a look at the ports here, and uh, because there's, there's a lot of good stuff on here. So let's take another look at the uh, magnesium case we've got here, and as you can see, it's a little bit of a fingerprint magnet, but that's nothing that, you know, you can't fix with a little bit of a wipe down or maybe some stickers. The bottom of the laptop is pretty premium looking for $200, and uh, you know, you're know you obviously not gonna be seeing that much. The best part of this laptop, my favorite feature, is this USB Type-C port, which is really cool. And this thing charges with USB-C optionally, and there's its, it has its own power adapter here, which I'm pretty much never gonna use because you know the convenience of having this thing charge with a USB-C adapter is just incredible because the battery in this thing is 10,000 milliamp hours. I don't think it says anywhere on here, but you know, for the low power consumption of this device, that's incredible. And being able to charge it with basically any power brick that I have is just ridiculous. I have one that's like, what is it, like 30,000 milliamp hours, which means that the battery life is quadrupled. As you can see, there's also a USB 3.0 port here. And on the other side, we've got a bootable SD card slot. We've got a headphone jack and a USB 2.0 port. And as far as the ports go, that's all. The keyboard, though, is probably worth talking about. And this is an ISO or ISO layout keyboard, which is common in Europe. And it's, it's not the one that we'd normally use in America, which is the ANSI or ANSI layout. And... Uh, it's, it's not bad, you can get used to it. The keys here are a, you know, a UK layout, but you can change that. And uh, I've already changed it to the US layout. And the keyboard feels really good. It sounds good. Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty nice. The trackpad, it's a bit loud. So if you're using it in bed and uh, you don't want to disur disturb anybody, then you, know, you might want to turn on tap to click. But for now, I'm gonna plug this thing into a USB-C dongle and uh, see what it looks like on a monitor. So I've connected the Pinebook Pro to this Best Buy USB-C dongle, which has an HDMI port, a USB port, and a USB-C power port. And also to my USB hub here, which has mouse and keyboard and audio interface. And all of that hardware seemed to work pretty well, pretty fast. I think the, uh, you know, the monitor here is 1080p, the same resolution as the Pinebook Pro, and uh, it's just one of my favorite resolutions. It's one of the best resolutions of all time. You can't go wrong. The OS recognized everything pretty well, like, without any trouble. Even the USB audio interface, which is great. And the one downside is that the USB port on this dongle doesn't really seem to work, which might mean that the USB-C port on this can't support a uh, USB connection, which 
is not not too big of a deal considering there's a USB 3 port here and a USB 2 port here over on the on the right. And just to take a quick look at the OS, the uh, OS that ships with this thing by default is uh, sort of a Debian hybrid. And uh, we can look, take a look and see what this thing says by typing this command here. And it says it's Debian Linux 9.9. .9. So it's not the current version of Debian. And it's also not the current Linux kernel. And this Linux kernel is pretty out of date. And it requires a bunch of patches in order to actually work. I think that they're making rapid progress on the OS. And it seems like they're working pretty hard to get this up to the mainline Linux kernel. And one of the reasons is because there are now drivers in Linux and X which support the uh, GPU in this thing with open source drivers, which should work better than the binary blobs that are in here right now. The GPU performance is a, is a little, little sketchy at the moment. I think it's going to improve. But to, to just check that out a little bit, we're going to open up YouTube. And uh, just load up a Tim Heidecker video, one of my favorites. And this is a 1080p uh, video. And there's a, there's a little bit of stuttering, and once it gets going, it seems all right. Yeah. Seems good. Hey everybody, my name is Tim Heidecker, and uh, you're watching Tim's Kitchen Tips. This is my new cooking show. One thing I did notice is that uh, this... Build of Chrome, it seems to be a custom build of Chrome, and it comes with this extension pre-installed called H264ify, and I think the reason that they do that is because this device isn't really powerful enough to play like the, you know, whatever the new stuff that um, Google's using for YouTube. So they, they force the page to vend the H264, which is like hardware decodable on this GPU. So YouTube works pretty fine, which is nice, you know, especially on a, on a laptop that's... The, the system on chip on this thing is, like, pretty low power, so it's nice that we're able to have, you know, 1080p YouTube playback, and it's supposed to be able to do 4K video playback as well. I don't have any 4K videos uh, on my machine, so I can't really tell. And I think that that's only supported when you're just playing it directly from the device. Like I said, the GPU performance is a little weird, if you'll if you'll notice that there's if you if you just even just select this desktop there's a little bit of wobbling and I'm not sure exactly what's going on there but that should improve like very quickly with updated drivers um, I did a, a little bit of light testing on this thing uh, as you might be able to read here in this terminal I I got Stepmania building Stepmania is an open source clone of Dance Dance Revolution and I I got that building here on ARM and We'll just take this for a small test drive. So you can see how, like, a, you know, it's a relatively... The game is kind of light on your hardware. It's not really that complicated, but it's still, it's still a 3D game, you know, under the hood, even though it's 2D scrolling arrows. And uh, you'll be able to see some a little bit of choppiness, which is coming from those, uh, those GPU drivers, which need to be updated. And for a game like this, a rhythm game, you really want to have like smooth 60 FPS, uh, you know, scrolling. So anything that's a little under that, it's it's very very noticeable. Um, let's just turn this up, the speed up a little bit, so you can see the uh, frame rate. So if you can notice, it's a little choppy. And uh, again, that's something that the 
GPU, fixed GPU drivers coming soon, should fix. Um, but I built Stepmania on this computer because it's a, it's a pretty good test of both the 3D performance and the compute power because it's kind of a mid-range sort of software project and it's, it's definitely not anywhere near as big as the Linux kernel, but it's also not small. So it took me about 20 minutes to get this built and that was using, I think, three cores at the time. I didn't want to overload the machine. I still wanted to be able to do other stuff. And, you know, it took about 20 minutes. So I think that as far as the compute power of this thing goes, it's, it's very impressive. The GPU drivers, once they get fixed, should be pretty good. There's also some really cool hardware features where here, down here at the bottom, I don't know if you can see that in the video because I have the tripod here, but there's a CPU frequency selector. So you can choose whether you're in performance mode or conservative mode or power save mode. And you can even choose specific CPU frequencies. Like the bottom one here is 408 megahertz and the top one is 1.99 gigahertz, which I guess is the, you know, the top speed of this CPU. And everything else works pretty well. They've got, I even installed Reaper, which is a, uh, it's really cool because there's like, let me see if I can find it here. Yeah, Reaper. Um, Reaper is a digital audio workstation. It's like a professional quality digital audio workstation. And, you know, this thing, you can make, you know, any kind of music in this thing. The one downside about Linux is that there's no virtual instruments available for it, really. But you can do, you know, multi-track recording. And here I've got like a very simple you know, loop with some, with four tracks here, and I'll just play that and see how, uh, how that goes. Yeah, it's, it works pretty well. I'm like very, very excited to have, um, a professional quality DAW here on such a, you know, such a cheap computer that's, you know, running Linux, and I'm just, thrilled with the fact that the the Reaper guys put out, you know, an ARM build of that of that program. It's really cool. Some other things that can test out the the uh, performance of this device. I set up a Windows 2000 VM and I'll just do this to to load it. And of course, Windows 2000 is an x86 operating system, so it's not native to ARM. But we're still running a QEMU uh, emulator here, which is running Windows 2000. And we'll, we'll just let it boot up into the desktop and see how long that takes. Just to give, it, give you a rough idea of, like, the, the CPU power this thing is, is capable of. You know, running Stepmania and Reaper just now, I think, should give you a pretty good idea that the CPU is, like, it, it does what it's supposed to do. And, you know, honestly, that was pretty fast startup, <laughs> considering this isn't even... You know, this is not an x86 machine. It's emulating this basically from the bottom up. Got to give a shout out to Windows 2000. It's the, the best personal computer operating system ever made, I think. It's built on NT technology. That's, that's how you know it's good. Beautiful sound. <laughs> and uh, still taking a little while to get to the desktop here. And, you know, obviously this isn't really usable in any meaningful sense. But it is cool that it's possible to emulate an entire other architecture with like a, honestly a pretty heavyweight operating system on on this device and it's a laptop you know so it's basically it's just a very very impressive thing to to see i'm just going to escape here and i think that should give you a pretty good idea of how this thing works the default OS, like I said, is a Debian-based OS, and it comes with 
Mate, or Mate, which is the evolution of the GNOME 2 uh, desktop environment, which, you know, everyone's familiar with from the mid-2000s. If you, if you use Linux in the mid-2000s, then you're be, you'll be right at home here with, uh, with the Pinebook Pro default OS. I think that there's a build of Manjaro Linux, like, available right now, and I think that there's there's some guys working on a mainline kernel, so it should be very soon that the default OS gets massively upgraded. So the Pinebook Pro, it's a pretty good computer, especially for $200, and the fact that it's made by an open source community-based hardware vendor, I think that the whole idea is just amazing. The, the community support that has already, you know, that I've already gotten from just going onto the Discord and the IRC channel and the forums, just solving problems, has, uh, you know, it's very inspiring. It reminds me of, like, you know, the, the early 2000s or the mid-2000s when, you know, you just have a computer problem, you go onto some forum and somebody would answer your question. Except that at the same time, everyone's sort of building the OS together and they're, you know, they're working out, like, little bugs in the, in the, in the software and things like that, and it's, it's just really cool. The Pine64 people who are actually involved in the company, I think that they're like extremely responsive. They, they post constantly on their, their blog and the uh, IRC channel about what they're doing. They're building a, a, in addition to this device, they're building a phone, they're building a tablet, a smartwatch, and I wouldn't doubt that they're working on a successor to this eventually. Um, and if this is any indication, then the next devices that they're going to make are going to be really cool. Um, I'm excited for the OS updates, personally. Once the GPU performance gets a little bit better, I think that uh, I'll be able to use it for pretty much everything that I would want on like a, you know, a daily basis. I think the fact that Reaper is available for this thing is just, you know, kind of a game changer when it comes to creative software. I think that one of the things that generally holds people back from jumping into Linux as, you know, a daily OS is sort of the lack of, like, professional quality creative software. And the fact that Reaper is there, you know, many people use Reaper in the, in the audio industry, like the, the recording industry, every day. And so it's a real thing that you can use to make any kind of music that you want. Um, and that's really cool to me. The... Everything else about the OS is, is pretty standard. I'm personally looking forward to spending a little bit more time customizing it. I uh, probably don't need most of the features that are in here. And I think that, you know, if I can just strip away everything that I wouldn't even need, then I can make it as fast as possible. And I think that's one of the coolest parts about using an open source OS is you can do whatever you want. And with an open source computer like this, you can take it one step further. There's documentation for how to open this thing and mess around with the insides. Uh, it has a PCI Express port. Basically, there's an adapter that you can get to install an M.2 um, storage device in this thing, and it supports, you know, four lanes of PCI Express, which means, theoretically, you could, you know, hook up any PCI Express device to this thing and do stuff with it. And that's just something I think you're probably not going to see in a mainstream laptop, and compared to the other devices that are in this price range, the $200 price range, it's very versatile. I think that, you know, most of the Chromebooks that I've seen don't come with the level of ports that are on here, and most of the, you know, the Windows 10 S devices or, or whatever that you see that, that, that are around the $200 mark, they don't have a USB-C port, and especially the 1080p screen. The webcam is even 1080p, which is really impressive. I'm not going to use the webcam that very much, but it is cool that it's there, and there's a microphone in it. Speaking of the webcam and the microphone, there is a hardware switch. Basically, there's a key combination that you can press, and there's circuitry in the keyboard that will detect a certain key combination, and you can use that to essentially physically shut down the connection between the uh, the machine and the webcam or the radios like the white the Wi-Fi or Bluetooth and the microphone. So you it's basically like an inbuilt hardware privacy switch, which I think you know in the in the modern era it's very useful. 
especially, and that, that's one of the strengths of this, you know, kind of niche hardware is that you get to build in features like that and you don't have to worry about it being scalable for like, you know, millions of users or whatever. And I think that's, that's really amazing. Again, I, I think that if you're interested in buying one of these things, check out pine64.org and they are having a, another batch of the Pinebook Pro available soon. So if you want to check that out, you can probably order one. There's going to be an ANSI keyboard option, so you won't have to get the ISO keyboard like I did. And I think everyone would like the Pinebook Pro as much as I do, especially if you're a, a Linux user or you want to get into it. It's a perfect opportunity to just get your feet wet. Also, shout out to Chrono Trigger for the uh, year 1999 landscape, which is the, the wallpaper here. I, I use that on every computer. I just think it just reminds me of sort of the, you know, the peak of human, human civilization, 1999 which was when uh, Windows 2000 was released. Anyway, see you next time. Peace out.